Amen. Amen. I'm reminded, you know, so often when we pray for our children about when we dedicate babies here and children that um, we, we often implore the, the, the parents to raise their children in such a way that to follow Jesus would only be a natural thing. That the model that we set before our children, um, model the love and the kindness and the, and the truth of Jesus Christ. That it would only be natural that they'd follow after the God of their father and mother. Amen. Amen. I'm a firm believer in that. You know, I don't believe that our children have to go through the, the terrible twos, terrible threes, and the, and the rebellious teenage years. I believe that the power of God is so much stronger than that. And as we model Christian living and as we pray for our children, believe God, and we train them and direct them in the path that they should go, the Bible says. They shall not depart from it. So um, parents, I mean, we encouraged moms last week, but you're doing a great job. And, uh, and you know, and our kids are such a precious, precious, precious um, I don't want to say commodity, but a precious, <laughs> just a precious thing in the sight of God and for us. Amen. Well, this week we've been on a, um, we left our message series last week for Mother's Day, but we continue it again this week. And we've been talking about this message series from here to there, how to live the life that God has intended you to live. And we talked about first week that we talked about Abraham and how to get from here to there in your life. You see, there's a place that we all know, a purpose, a destiny that God has called us all to. A place that, that we, we feel that God has spoken to us in our heart. It's a, it's, a, it's a dream, it's a vision that God has given us. It's a purpose that we have inside of our heart. A place, a destiny in our life that we, that we believe that we, we, should, we should go to and arrive at. Every person here has destiny. Every person here has purpose. God has created every single person with a sense of purpose and destiny. Nobody is a mistake in the sight of God. There's not one person that is a mistake in the sight of God. Amen. Not one person. But oftentimes, to get from here to there to where we, where, where we feel God wants us to go, it's a process and it's a journey. And we don't always understand or see how we can get to where God wants us to go. You see, we may have a plan. God may have a plan for our life, a purpose, and a destiny. And just because he has that for us doesn't mean that we're going to arrive there. We have potential. God has put potential in every single one of us. A potential to, 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 to reach our destiny, a, a potential to, to serve our purpose. Because, and we're, and we're able to arrive in that purpose and walk in that purpose, in that destiny, by following him, making a choice to follow him and his plan for our life. But wouldn't it be great for us to, to know exactly how to get from here to there? Wouldn't it be great for us to understand all the directions we need to go, all the right turns that we need to make beforehand to be able to get to where God wants us to go? Have you ever been lost and it just felt like you, you're making one wrong turn after another, maybe in a car, maybe in a bike, maybe walking, but what about in life? It just seems like one wrong turn after another, and it's just like the, the GPS system saying recalculating route, recalculating route, recalculating route, and you, you get tired of hearing it over and over and over again. And the great thing about God, the great thing about serving our God is that no matter how many wrong turns you make, he's still able to get you back on track. He'll recalculate that route. He'll get you to the destiny that, he, that was typed in from the very beginning. You see, GPS only works as, as well as we listen to it. If we're not listening to what the GPS is saying, we're not going to go in the right direction. To get to the destination that God has for us, the destination that was already typed in, we've got to listen. I mean, GPS is such an amazing, amazing piece of technology, and we, it becomes a part of our life. Everywhere that I go that's, that's new, the, this, uh, this afternoon I'm, 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 I'm going to be away for a few days, go traveling, and, and, uh, and, and my GPS will be something that I will use very closely. I'll be able to know where to go, what turns to make, where to avoid, wherever, where, those, where there's traffic. Sometimes the, the, the GPS will take you around those, that traffic to get around it to get you to where you need to go. And the marvelous thing about us as Christians is we do have a GPS. His name is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we listen to him, 
He will get us to where we've got to go every single time. Amen? Maybe God has given you a dream. Maybe God has given you a vision, a destination that, that, that you're going towards. It just seems like uh, you just don't know how to get there. Maybe it's starting a, a, a new job or starting a new business. Maybe, it, maybe it's, it's having that marriage that you've always dreamt about, that you believe that God has put in your heart. Maybe it's that right investment. Maybe it's even just marrying the, the right person. Maybe it's a dream for yourself. Maybe it's a dream for your family. Maybe it's a dream for your career. Maybe it's a dream for the kingdom of God that, that you want to see fulfilled in your lifetime. And it seems big, and it seems like it's not even possible. And you wonder to yourself, how can I get there? How do I make the right turns to get to the place that God wants me to go? The steps don't always seem clear. And the thing about us as, as humans, or the human side of us, <laughs> the human side of us, you know, we're not human, we're not, we're, not, we're not bodies with spirits inside of us. We're spirits that are wearing a body. <laughs> and sometimes that, that, that mind and the flesh gets, in, gets us in trouble and keeps us from making the right decisions. That's why it's so important for us, for us to be in tune with the spirit, of the, with what the spirit of God is saying. And no matter what wrong turns that you make, have made in the past, you'll get back on track when you listen to him. It might seem too big. It might seem too impossible to get to where God wants you to go or, or where you feel like God intended you for you to be already. You might feel like you're behind on the game. You might feel like you have not arrived in time. You might feel like time is up. It's, getting, it's far past that time. Time is getting short. But God is able to do the impossible in your life. He's able to make up for the years that the, the Bible says that the, the, the canker worms have, have devoured, all, that, that the devil has destroyed, has, has kept you back, and has, 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 has destroyed in your life. He's able to restore it. Even Job, everything was taken away from him, but God restored everything, double, in 18 months. If God can do that in 18 months for you, he can do, he, for him, he can do the same thing for you. God is not a respecter of persons. God can do the impossible in your life. We often focus on all the, the bad and the hardship that Job went through, and that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is God's faithfulness, God's goodness. And God wants to show you that goodness. God wants to show you that kind of restoration. God wants to show you that kind of increase in your life. Every person has a plan. From, from the very conception of you in your, womb, your mother's womb, God had a plan for you. So much conversation about abortion these days. And here's a hot topic. The reason why we as believers believe that every life is valuable because every person was made, is made in the image of God. Every person is made in the image of God. At conception, science tells us there's a flash of light that happens. That's a moment when light, life comes into the, the conceived baby. It's not just a piece of flesh, it's a spirit designed in the image of God. And everyone from conception has a purpose, has a plan, but the devil is out there wanting to destroy destinies and, and people's plans and, and purposes and people's lives. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but the Bible says that Jesus has come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. God has a plan for every single person. No life is a mistake. God has a purpose for every single person. And God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. But the devil will do anything 
to keep that plan and that destiny to, from coming to fruition. And I believe that's why he's working so hard right now. Destroying destinies. Today I want to read out of Romans 12, 1 through 12. And talking about finding your purpose in life. Finding your purpose. It says in Romans 12, 1 through 11, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, though the grace given me to everyone who is among you, not only think of himself, not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. For as we have, have members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having them gifts differing according to the grace that God has given us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let them prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let them use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love and honor in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. See, finding our purpose in life, finding our purpose as believers, finding our purpose as, as, as humans is closely connected with our relationship with God. We cannot find our purpose, we cannot find God's plan for our life, we cannot find the destiny, arrive at the destiny that God has for us outside of our relationship with God. It's very closely connected, it, it intertwines us together. He is the source of your destiny, he is the source of your purpose. He is your designer. The Bible says he's formed you and he knew you in your mother's womb. He created you with a purpose. He knit you together, the Bible says. He designed you for a specific purpose in life. Here on this earth, the Bible says that you are born. The told said to Esther that you're, you're born for such a time as this. You could have been born in any other era of time. You could have been born in the 1400s, the 1200s, the 1600s, the 1800s. You could have been born in a different decade. You could have been born in a different country by different parents. But God chose you to be here where you are right now for such a time as this. For the purpose he has for your life. God has a destiny. God has a plan. And you have an assignment. There is a mission and there is assignment that was written upon your life from God. And it's for us as believers to walk out that assignment, to walk out that mission for our lives. And the devil will do anything to destroy that assignment, to destroy that purpose that God has for your life, to destroy your destiny. But we as believers have authority over the works of the devil in our life. We can guarantee walking in our destiny, in our purpose. When we take a, because we, knowing who we are in Christ and the power that he's already given us. God's not trying to keep his will a secret from you. God's not trying to keep what he wants you to do a secret. The problem is, is that we want to know everything right, in, right, right ahead of time. Finding God's will is often just one step out of, of obedience at a time. Just one step of obedience at a time. And God unravels and God reveals what his true purpose and, his, and, 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 that, and that purpose and that destiny becomes more and more clear. 
But our purpose is so closely, closely intertwined and connected with our relationship with God because he is the purpose giver. And I want to tell you some things today about finding our purpose that's going to help us today. Is First of all, one thing that's going to help us find our purpose is this. is Finding your purpose begins with totally surrendering your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. You will not be who God intended you to be without a relationship and surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's many people who have have prayed the prayer and made him savior, but they've not surrendered to his lordship. They have not made him the lord of their life. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he reigns in our heart. He reigns our life. He is the king. He is the boss. I gave my life to him because he gave his life for me. It's a life of total surrender to him. And when we got born again, the born again is this phrase that we get from the Bible where Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of, see, the kingdom of God. And it says in, 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 in John chapter 3, verse 9, it says, and you must be born again. He was, he was saying this. He was saying this is a requirement. Being for, born from above is what that means. When we give Jesus our life, we say, Jesus, forgive me of my, my sins, less of me, more of you. I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. At that moment, he, make, he gives you a new heart and, and, and quickens your spirit and become alive in him. And we give him our life, and at that moment we say, Jesus, I make you Lord, I make you boss, I make you ruler over my life, I give myself to you. And we present ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to him. And we humble ourselves before him and we say, Jesus, you are Lord. Lord, I I surrender to your lordship in my life. I surrender to you because, Lord, I know in you I will find my purpose. I'll find the most fulfilled life that I could ever live in a relationship with you. And you have an assignment and you have a mission for my life. And God gives us the power to live this surrendered life. He gives us the grace, the empowerment, the endowment to to be able to live this life of surrender to him. Imagine if God called us and told us that we had to live this Christian life all by ourselves. It's impossible. To have victory over sin. To have victory over the works of the enemy in our life. That's impossible. But it's because of the grace and the power that's working inside of us that we have power over sin. We have victory over sin, sickness, and and disease, and death. and, And we have victory in our lives. Being a Christian and living the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's a life, it's life in the supernatural. And the more in tune that we get to with the, into the spirit of God and, and who we are and our spirit man, we become more in tune with what God is doing in, on the earth, in the world, and, and we can live our life in a supernatural way. And when we receive Christ, this grace to do that was imparted to us. Grace is not a covering for sin. It's an empowerment over the power of sin in our lives. The blood of Jesus was given to us by his grace. The blood of Jesus is washes away our sin. But we are given grace to overcome the power of sin in our life. Grace is not a license to sin. It's not because we have grace and we're able to sin. Oh, God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. God has given us grace to be free from sin. Power over sin in our life. Power to live out your purpose. Power to live out who you are in him. And when we receive that grace, we begin to to be connected to the purpose that God has called us into 
And our life becomes more about him and less about us. It's about, it's, Lord, more of you, less of me. And, you know, and then and when we're like, we, we humble ourselves before him, more and more grace is imparted into our life. We have the grace to overcome, to have victory and increase in every area of our life. James 4, 6 says this. You want more grace in your life? It says you can. But it gives more grace. Therefore, this is how. Therefore, he says, resist. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves before him, we say, God, not my will, but your will. You position yourself to receive more grace on your life, more favor, more empowerment in your life. More grace to overcome sickness. More grace to overcome sin. More grace to, to, to overcome lack in your life. More grace to be and, and to fulfill God's plan on your life. When we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, the Bible says in due time, he will lift you up. God has called you to live in victory. God has called you to be an overcomer. He's not called us to walk around. Just hum- the, the humble does not mean that we're just, 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 we've got no spine and we always look down the ground and we, f- we feel awful about ourselves. It's a place of power. It's a place of authority. Because as we humble ourselves, we're able to draw from the authority that God gives us as sons and daughters of God. But he opposes the proud. He actively works against the proud. (laughs) He opposes the proud. Pride is a very powerful force. Pride destroys marriages. Pride destroys countries. Pride Pride comes before destruction. At some point in our lives, we had to humble ourselves to come to Jesus. We had to lay the pride aside. That's usually the, the, the strongest thing that's working against us coming to Christ is our own pride. Because we say, I can, I can be a good enough person on my own. I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can live life by myself. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I can, I can do it. I'm my own God is essentially what you're saying. But we humble ourselves before him. We can receive more grace to be who he's called us to be. It's the increase in victory in every area of our life. We look there and back to Romans 12, 1 through 2. In verse 2, it says to do not be conformed. Can we go back to Romans 12, 1 and 2? Next slide. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world system is what it's talking about. The world system. And we are bombarded by the world system everywhere that we look. And it's our job as believers. There's something that God does. God imparts grace for you. And there's a part that we do. We transform our minds. We transform our minds by renewing them through the word of God, through prayer, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't renew our minds by sitting in front of TV. (laughs) We don't renew our minds by by seeing what they're saying, what, 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 what is good and what is bad. The Bible says in the last days that what was good will be called evil. What is good is really going to be called evil. What's evil is good. But we renew our minds as we base our life on the word of God and what scripture says above everything else. Not what Hollywood says, not what the media says, not what we learned in college, not what we learned in school. But by what the word of God says. And there is an agenda. There is a, the, it's the world system that it's talking about here. Be transformed. We are supposed to think different. <laughs> we are supposed to be different. We are the people of God. The Bible says you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a peculiar people. You are God's chosen people, chosen out from the world. You think differently. You act differently. You live differently. 
You don't go by the mainstream. You go against the stream. You're like a salmon. You swim upstream. Everyone's going this way. You're going the other way. If the way you're swimming is too easy, you're going the wrong direction. If everyone's speaking well of you, you've got to look out. If everybody has, if somebody has something good to say about you all the time, you're doing something wrong. If you want to make a difference in this world, you've got to be willing to stand up for God's truth and stand up for righteousness. You've got to ask God for a boldness in your heart, a boldness to come upon your life through the power of the Holy Spirit to take that stand for righteousness, to take that stand for the word of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Get into Scripture. Spend time with God. Be, be, be here and, and hear preaching and, be, and let the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, be imparted into you. Then it says, and know the perfect will of God. That you may be able to prove and to show what is the, the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Many people don't enter in, and many people don't live in the perfect will of God. They live in God's permissive will, which God allows because of our choices. But the perfect will of God is a place that we can live as we follow him, follow his voice, and we are, we are, our mind is transformed, we're following him with all of our heart. But, but people might say, well, if it's God's will, why does it happen? The Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Is everyone coming to repentance? No, it's his will. He's given it to us, but there's this element of our choice, our free choice as a human being. We have the ability, which means that we have the ability to be able to choose from what's right and what's wrong. Just because we exercise our free will does not mean it's right. We are not God. He is. We have the ability to make the choice of, of, on God's side or on the side of the devil. God has given us a choice to follow him or not to follow him. And it's God's will that everybody come to repentance and, and, and everyone comes to him. And, he, and, he, and he's, he, he set up a system. He set up a plan. He set up a way for people to come into salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. He died on that cross. He bled. He died. And three days later, he rose from the dead. So we have God's permissive will and God's per, per, his perfect will. You, God's permissive will isn't God's best for your life. We often settle for what's, what's good rather than what's best. Choose not to settle for anything in your life. <laughs> settle for one thing. Settle for God's best. God's best inquire, requires sacrifice, it requires investment. Sometimes it requires a little bit of waiting. It's like when you're saving up for something that you really, really want. You're putting money away, you're saving, you're saving, you're saving. Then finally there's a day that you, when you reap the reward and it feels so good, you don't have any debt, you, just, you get to enjoy being right there in that moment. There's nothing better than being in the perfect will of God. And in the perfect will of God, we are going to find our true purpose. You will not find that kind of fulfillment anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else. You can't look anywhere for it, but you'll find it right in the center, the perfect center of God's will. And you can be there. And it's not as hard as it might sound. God has not made following him hard. You hear so many Christians say, it's hard being a Christian. Stop with the martyrism right now. It's not. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the power of God's word. 
You have the fellowship of other believers. You are empowered to make a difference in this world. The Bible says you are more than a conqueror. We are not victims in this world. We are victors in this world. We overcome. We are not underneath. The Bible says that you are above and not beneath. The Bible says that you're blessed coming in and going out. You are the lender and not the borrower. You're blessed in this city and you're blessed in the country. We need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. But many people live and die without finding God's purpose for their life. Every day they show up to a job that they totally hate. They, they, just hate, they, do, they hate waking up. It's just the, the same old routine every single day, day in and day out, just not really finding God's purpose. You kind of know what it is, but, but you, you've not taken those steps of faith to, to achieve what God has called you to. And it feels like you're in survival mode. And God did not design you for survival mode. He designed you for thriving mode. To thrive where you are in life. To to prosper where you are. You were created in God's image. You were created to make a difference. You weren't designed just to survive. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.18, it says this about those who are his. The path of the just. Is like the shining sun that shines brighter unto the perfect day. Another translation says, shines brighter and brighter to the noonday sun. It gets better and better. You build upon what happened over here, faith by faith, glory by glory. Number two, finding God's purpose for your life. You've got to remember that God has empowered you to fulfill your purpose. God didn't just leave you alone and just leave you up to, your, up to yourself to, to try to figure it all out and how to accomplish it all on your own. Let's look at Romans 12, 3 through 8, what it said there. It said, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, For as we have many members in one body, talking about us, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given us, let us use them. If prophecy, let them prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, and he who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality or with generosity. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So each person has been given a measure of faith according to what their purpose is. You have faith. God has given you faith for the purpose that he's called you to. He's given you specific faith for the purpose that he's called you to. It's a zeroed in, laser target kind of faith to accomplish what he's called you to accomplish. If God's called you to Build a business, he's given you zeroed in faith to build that business. God's called you to start a ministry, he's given you zeroed, zeroed in faith to start that ministry. If God's called you to promotion and overseeing and, and excelling and climbing that ladder and, 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 and getting to a, a place of promotion, he's given you zeroed in faith for that. What God has called you to do, he's given you faith for it. But sometimes we need, to, we, need to, we need to clear away everything else to actually see and operate in that faith. Because sometimes we feel like we just don't have it. That's when we get, re- or get our mind renewed. That's when we begin to understand who we are in Christ, what he's called us to do.
Number three, God will give you grace, which leads to a desire that must be pursued. We don't say that God gave us grace and we just leave it there. It needs to be walked out. Grace isn't lazy. Grace is an empowerment to do what God has called you to do. It's, it's an empowerment to do what you can't do on your own. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. What does that mean? <laughs> I believe that God wants to bring increase into our lives. I believe that God wants to prosper us where we are. It's so very clear in Scripture that God wants to, that, that God wants to bless us. I know there's, there's so many people have, the, have destroyed that truth in Scripture, and they brought a lot of questioning about it. But God does, according to Scripture, he wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. He wants to bring increase into your life. That's how. Because we delight ourselves in the Lord, we put, our heart comes to a place where it's not about us, but it's about him. Where he can trust us with the blessing, where, he can, where we can steward the blessing that God has for us. And we wonder why we haven't seen the blessing that we thought that we would have by now or walk in that increase that God has for our life. And this is the key to it all. To delight ourselves also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of our heart. Because when we're chasing him, when he becomes our one and only desire, when it becomes all about him, our heart aligns to his heart. We begin to have the same heart that he has. And when he brings increase into our life, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about being, a ble being blessed to be a blessing. It's about, it's about using what he's given us to change the world around us. And it's then, and only then, we will see the blessing of God to come into our life. When we delight in him, and when we delight in him, we become more like him. God is a natural giver. You want to see increase in your life? Learn to give. 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 So will I tithe? That's not giving. Give. That's returning. <laughs> give you want to see real increase in your life the Bible says this, that, that God blesses those who give give and that shall be given unto you those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly but those who sow generously and bountifully will also reap bountifully if your hand is, is closed-fisted, you cannot, you cannot only give, you can't give, you, can, you, know, you can't even receive. It's going to come your way, it's just going to fall right out of your hand. But when you have an open hand, not only can you give, but you can receive. You position yourself to receive from God. And this is, the, this is God's economy works different than the world's economy. God's economy is totally different than the world's economy. The greatest way to stifle God's purpose and plan in your life and keep you from, 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 from reaching God's plan and purpose for your life is to keep it all to yourself. Givers and generous people get God's attention. <laughs> he wants to bless those people. The Bible says that the generous, it says in, in, in Psalm, I'm not going to quote it exactly how it says it, but it says that basically the generous are given more. But those who hoard, he keeps from them. It's the same way with our, with our finances, with what we have, our resources, as it is with the gift that God has given us. We've got to be, able to be able to be in a position where we give. It's less about us and more about God's will being fulfilled in our life. You have two seas in the Holy Land. You have the Sea of Galilee. You have the Dead Sea. They're, they're all fed by the same river. 
The Sea of Galilee has, has, it flourishes with different wildlife and, and fish and, and, and plants that don't exist anywhere else in the world, very lush around the, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But the, 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 but the, sea, the, the, the Dead Sea is fed by the same river, and it's dead and lifeless. It has the greatest salt content than any other place, any body of water in the world. In fact, if you were to lay down in it right now, you're able to float. You won't sink to the bottom. The reason why is because the Sea of Galilee has an inlet and an outlet. The Dead Sea just has an inlet. And that's how we need to live. We need to live like the Sea of Galilee. We have an inlet and we have an outlet. We're receiving and we're giving. It's coming in and going out. I am a conduit and I am a vessel of God. I want him to use me in this world and in this life. I will not become like the Dead Sea stagnant. I will not sit and, and, and hear another sermon preach and not do something with it and use what I've, what, I've, what I've heard today to go out and reach the life of somebody else. I will not, I will not, I will not keep what, what God has blessed me with to myself, but I'm going to go and I'm going to learn and I'm going I'm to use this opportunity to be a blessing to this world that God has called me to. But we live in a world that's more, more, more. New houses, new cars, new clothes. More, more, more. Me, me, me. But God says less of me. Less of, John the Baptist said less of me. More of you, Lord, in my life. But we must pursue the desire that God has given us in our life. It not only says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart, but Isaiah 58, 14 says, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and he will cause you to ride on the hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, when he's number one in our lives, number one, we say that he's number one, but I can tell you this, if we look at our calendars today and we look at our checkbooks, that'll really reveal to you Who's number one? <laughs> Ooh, pastor, that hurt. It's tough. In abiding in him and 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 and, and delighting ourselves in him. It always flows from a relationship with him. Being connected, abiding in the vine, the Bible, the Bible says in John 15, 1, 5, it says this. Jesus said to his, to, to his, his disciples, said, I am the vine. I am the true vine, he says. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he's taken away. He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Are you bearing fruit today? For without me, you can do nothing. He is the vine. We are the branches. And when we abide in him, we are connected to the source. And the power of God, the resurrection power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit flows through that vine into the branches. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. How? Through the power that works in you. That's in you. We're not looking for an outside source. 
It's the power of God in you. He will cause you to bear fruit. He will cause you to be productive. He will cause you to increase. He will cause you to prosper. He will cause you to walk out the, the, the calling and the purpose that he has for your life. But our job is to keep that relationship vibrant and that, that, that relationship on fire and burning and our heart's desire is him and only him. And I urge you today to keep that fire burning. Keep the fire burning. Your relationship with Christ, keep it burning. Keep it red hot, red hot, red hot. Let it be a tall bonfire so the whole world can see it. How do we keep our relationship with him on fire? How do we, in the natural, how do we keep, a, how do we keep our, our fire, a fire burning? You have a campfire, first of all. You need to have a spark somewhere. But you can't have a fire without wood, and you can't have fire without oxygen. God has given you the fire already. He's put a spark inside of every single one of you. The Bible says to stir up the gift of God that's within you. Stir up those ashes. Stir up those coals. Remember those days when you were on fire for him or you loved him so passionately. Stir it up. Then add some wood on that fire. Get into God's word. The word is like wood. It gives something to burn, something to, to live out, something. It's the source of the fire. It's the word of God. And then, and then we pray and we praise him. And, that, and that's, the, that's the oxygen that, that, that causes the, the whole fire to ignite and to burn and to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Keep the fire burning. Spend time with him every day. Live, eat, sleep, Jesus. Wake up in the morning, and may he be the first thing that you think about. When you lay down to go to bed at night, may he be the last thing that you think of. May you have dreams of him. May he be all that's on your lips in the morning. May he be all you think about during the day. Abide in the vine. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I'm not going to have you come forward. We're going to close this up. Sam and Vince. Fourthly, God has given you everything you need to walk in victory. We need to know that we are sons and daughters of God. Those who have been born again, those who are, those who are, are saved, those who have made him Lord of, our, Lord of his life, you are a chosen people. You are children of God. You have rights and privileges in heaven. The Bible says that you are, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing, it says in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. On top of that, you have his word and every promise in his word. You have his name to take authority over the work to the enemy in your life. You have the blood of Jesus that provides div divine protection and has paid the price for our sins. That has helped us to walk in a, that, that when we recognize what he's done, it helps us to walk in our destiny. He's given us angels to help minister to his saints. Angels that work on our behalf. He's given us the Holy Spirit who empowers us and who enables us to do what he's called us to do. And he, 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 he's called us to be fruitful. What we've got to do as believers is to look at our lives and be looking for fruit. You see, when you have a fruit tree and it's not bearing fruit, sometimes what you've got to do is prune it. And maybe today there's some things that you have in your life that need a little bit pruning, some things that you just need to cut off, some things that are keeping you from producing the fruit that God wants to produce in your life. God wants you to be heavy laden with fruit in your life. You are intended to produce, you're intended to bear fruit. But what is it today? That's keeping that fruit from bearing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And today, Lord, we, 
abide in the vine of Jesus. We abide in your vine. We are the branches. You are the vine. We abide in you, like just like you abide in us today, Lord. Father, we want to live fruitful lives, lives laden with fruit. Lord, to reach the people who are around us and live out the purpose that you've called us to. Lord, not just for ourselves, but for those who are around us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God of more than enough, Lord, that, that Lord, the fruit that we bear can be consumed by those around us, Lord. It, it's affecting lives. It's feeding the hungry. It's reaching out to those who are lost. It, 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 it's, it's, bringing, it's bringing prosperity, Lord. It's bringing success into other people's lives. And maybe today you're here, you are not connected with the vine. Maybe today you're here, you do not have a relationship with the Lord. Maybe you're here... And you don't know him. I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, lived a sinless life, and he came to die on the cross. That one reason is to die for you. To die for your sins, to pay the price for your sins. He took your place. Every single one of us were destined to an eternity in hell, separated from God. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And when we place our faith in him, we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I want to live for you. I give you my life. At that moment, you're what the Bible calls born again. He gives you a new spirit. He, he quickens your spirit and makes your spirit alive again. And he gives you a new heart. It empowers you to live this life. And today, if that's you, I invite you to say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. I want to live for you all the days of my life. In that prayer, he will hear. Maybe you're here today and you are already a believer, but there's some things that you feel in your life need pruning. The fruit's not been there lately. You say, God, I want to live a fruitful life. But Lord, today I surrender. I surrender once again to you. I surrender my life fresh and new to you today. Those things that have kept me from bearing fruit. Even the good things in my life. I've been so busy with all the good things that, that Lord, I've not been able to produce the fruit that I've been called to produce. And if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Yes, 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 yes. And if that's you and you raise your hand, would you come up to this altar? Let's, let's, just, let's just worship him and praise him and just lay it all down to him. And if you have a need today and you just want to go before God, I invite you to come. Come, come. If you raise your hand, let's come. Let's come. Let's come. Let's come. It's important to take that step of faith. It's important to take that step of faith to show God that you mean business. God, I mean business today. Lord, I'm going to allow you to change my heart. I mean business with you today. Let's worship him. Let's worship him.